directly, access these images directly. They're you know, putting all this information out for iPhone applications, all kinds of stuff. So they don't care if the information is out there. It's supposed to be out there. They want it out there. Uh, they're using it as a resource. They're doing you know, data mining with it to figure out traffic patterns. That's cool for them, better for us. Because now I have visualization, right? Now not only do I have bounding boxes, if I see you traveling from one bounding box to another, one MSC to another, at a specific rate, I know that you're probably on an interstate or on some other road or whatever. If I have a map, I can now approximate where you are within that map. And then I can watch you on cameras and try to figure out, oh, there's the same vehicle over and over and over. OK, so now I know what you drive, right? Or I have a good idea, because there are probably a handful of them all squished together on the interstate, right? But it's easy to track me, because you'll just see my Ferrari going by. <laughs> That's right, Megan. I got a Ferrari. <laughs> do you like Ferraris? I do. So that's a definite enhancement, right? And of course, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll kind of skip over this because it's, it's really information, but it's academic, right? I mean, the, the problem is that you still have to actually analyze the information, analyze the video. But um, we're kind of working on that. It's just not uh, pristine. So anyway, we'll talk a little bit about MZ catching instead. Yeah, so um, there's different resources for getting latitude and longitude of existing cell towers. I mean, there's the Open Cell ID project there. Google actually has a pretty complete, pro uh, pretty complete listing of cell towers and their locations and the cell ID and the LAI and all that good stuff. And you can actually query it through Google um, and just get all that information. And why is that important? Because you can then basically overlay um, those towers and specifically you can figure out what provider those towers belong to. So I say, okay, I've got the latitude and longitude for the tower. So I know the latitude, I know the actual coordinates of the bounding box of my MSC um, and I want to ask Google or Open Cell ID or some other way of getting that information um, where, uh, what towers fall within that boundary and where. So we just plot those in that graphic, in that bounding box so we know where they exist in that coverage area. And there's different ways of validating this. So for instance, you know, the maximum, the, the theoretical maximum distance of a GSM tower should be 23 miles on a flat terrain. And you know, if you have one tower in the middle of that giant MSC in Denver, that's probably not accurate. Um, you know, if you have a bunch and it accurately covers it, well, okay, well, I think that's high confidence. So um, you know, it just allows an attack to approximate which cell tower signal um, they'll be competing against. So if you know that a person is in Denver, you go to Denver, you got your NC catcher with you, you do um, other intelligence gathering on this person, you know that they're going to be at this particular cafe through some other, you know, again, through some other source, um, and you go there, you will be able to look up in relation to that location what other cell towers are around you, how far away they are. They are. You'll be able to maybe um, also take all of these other things, the C name, the HLR, um, you'll know that they use AT&T as a provider, so you can pre-configure MC Catcher to be AT&T, because maybe you didn't know that. Maybe they were T-Mobile. Maybe they switched from T-Mobile to AT&T overnight. Um, you'll be able to determine that, and um, that just helps you along when you're trying to uh, use MC Catching technologies. And um, it, it'll also just tell you, you know, if, if they're, if that, is that cafe sitting underneath the cell phone tower? Uh, is it, you know, on the fringe of a cell phone tower? So. You know, that just gives you a little bit more intelligence about your RF environment, about your um, cell phone environment when you're trying to launch an attack. And um, these things aren't even necessary. People do MC catching all day long without this information, but it helps. So, you know, any, any information yeah. you can get is useful information. This is all about enhancing your attack, right? Yeah. And as much information as you can possibly gather to make your attack as, you know, pristine as you can, that's what it's all about. And there are three, in my opinion, there are three main keys to in MZ catching, which is number one, knowing the provider, number two, knowing the MZ you're mm -hmm. actually targeting, and then the actual phone number for that individual that you're trying to target. And so, everybody go to Chris Padgett's talk at uh, DEF CON, because he'll yeah. be demonstrating an <laughs> MZ catcher there live, and I'm sure everybody's heard about that. Uh, hopefully if he's not shut down, but, yeah. but cross our fingers, he will still be uh, doing his talk. And um, also, what uh, Don was saying about um, getting MZs, in the United States, um, via the uh, HLR records that we can get, um, you don't get the MC of the person's phone number, but in the rest of the world, you can. So also, if you're launching MC catching attacks against somebody that's outside the United States, knowing their MC ahead of time helps. So um, that's some of the information you can get, but we really don't touch on this because this is kind of USA-centric. Oh, and very quickly, though, because we forgot to add a slide here, there is a provider that's out there claiming to sell the ability to reverse a phone number into an MC, right? 
for pretty much no, everybody. No, from an MC2 number. Or I'm sorry, from an MZ2 in number. So uh, that's very important for an attacker. And um, they're selling that for apparently a large upfront cost, which is why we haven't been able to do it, uh, but for a fraction of a cent afterwards. So. so now we know who you are, where you are, what your behavioral patterns are, what you're most vulnerable, et cetera. And uh, we're going to have to go through this quickly. I'll let you take it. OK, I'll take it. So um, changing someone's voicemail announcement to Rick Astley, yay, that's old. Um, very old. <laughs> so you wrote this slide. What is this? <laughs> what am I looking at? I don't even know what it is. Why, why are we doing this? So, Screw it. <laughs> We've got 10 minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. My beard might have gotten caught in the microphone. Well, the point of these, the point of these slides is, is pretty much that information. Oh, here's what, the is voice what it's all crawling. About. Oh, I'll cover this real quick. Yeah, okay. He's actually better at this anyway. So um, this is his specialty. Using uh, HLR caller ID information, and who knows about the voicemail break-in with caller ID spoofing? Everybody knows about that. Well, one of the funny things about it is when you try to do when you spoof caller ID and you call somebody's phone number, it's going to ring eight times or whatever, or they have to hit ignore, and it's going to ring. Maybe it's going to it's going to be noisy, right? Um, and then maybe you'll get into their, call, their voicemail box and yay. So um, who knows what slide dial is? It's this uh, free service online. You just call it. You enter in your friend's cell phone number. It kicks you directly into their voicemail without ringing their number. It might say, uh, it might ring at half a ring or a little half vibrate, or it might just come up with missed call. Um, but the technique they used to do this, nobody really knows, but one of the techniques is you can just create what's called a ring hunt group in asterisk, which will basically call your cell phone number, your car phone, who has a car phone still. Um, and, their, and your office On number, star. and your home number. It'll bring them all at once, and then the first person to pick up, everybody else gets dropped, right? It's just trying to find you. So what you do is you do a ring hunt group to the same number. So it makes two simultaneous phone calls to your cell phone number, and one of those is going to get kicked directly to voicemail, right? Everybody's had that experience. And the, f the one that doesn't get picked up, which is the voice call, which was trying to ring the phone number, gets dropped immediately. So the providers pick up the voicemail quick enough that nobody gets rung, your, your, phone, your phone won't ring. So just add caller ID spoofing to this. And now um, you get kicked directly into their voicemail with the caller ID spoofing without ringing their number. So if you do this at 2.30 AM, it won't ring eight times and wake them up. And they won't know until the next day when the damage is done. And um, with HLR, you can determine what provider the person has. So you know that these two providers are usually vulnerable to voicemail breaking, but these two aren't. So instead of attempting to do this attack on these two providers that, don't have, that aren't vulnerable and maybe failing and maybe giving it away or saying, you know, hey, I shouldn't be getting a, voice, uh, a call from my voicemail. That's odd. I won't pick that up. Um, you know, you, you yeah, don't just to attack. jump in real quick, I, I apologize to uh, interrupt. But just very quickly, one of the important things to note is that for some of the providers that actually will block caller ID spoofing and dumping into voicemail, they will ring regardless if you try mm -hmm. this slide all attack. So it's actually very important that you can uh, uh, determine what provider they are using. So real quick, so um, once you're in somebody's voicemail, um, you can start to dump the, the voicemails that are there, obviously, and you can dump the um, envelope information about that voicemail. So you can get the phone number of the person who left it. Well, then you repeat this attack again. So everything we just described on that person who left you that voicemail, and you say, oh, can I break into their, their voicemail too? Yeah, I can, okay. Well, you do this to everybody who left you a voicemail, and you do it to everybody who left them a voicemail, et cetera, et cetera, using HLR to make sure that you're doing it against vulnerable people. Um, and maximizing your success while minimizing your exposure. And what you end up is, is you end up crawling people's voicemails, getting the context of their voicemail, building social networks. Because previously, this attack, you just had phone numbers. Now we've got a name. Now we've got locations. So we're just adding lots and lots of context to this attack. And we're enhancing all of these original attacks, um, making them bigger and better and scarier. The best part is you can actually determine whether people are coworkers, whether people are re related, right. whether people are married. It's very interesting information. So even if you don't actually listen to the voicemails, or if you listen to them and they seem completely benign, you can still make those associations. You know that particular MSCs correspond with work because they tend to be there during the day, but they tend to be in different location at night. So those individuals that are in the same location at night, they are probably either related, living in the same area, and have a more um, friendship-oriented relationship but over time, you can, you can ascertain what these particular relationships are. And that's what this is all about. The social information mm -hmm. is key here. And so um, we skipped a bunch of stuff, but it was mostly just VoIP tricks that are enhanced by some of these techniques. And we really wanted to focus on the techniques more so than these other stupid tricks. So um, since we're running out of time, I really did want to cover uh, mitigations and defenses. 
And there's lots of stuff here. Um, we didn't fit it all into some slides, but you know, switch to a secure, a more secure provider. Um, CDMA is just uh, security through obscurity at this point because um, you know, if Karsten and all of his friends moved to America and started pay putting their attention on CDMA, it would fall in like three weeks. So. <laughs> Um, since CDMA pretty much exists nowhere but America and like Korea. But if I can interject, there's actually one very important point that we have to note. This is not the provider's fault. No. Okay. No. So a lot of this information, a lot of these attacks, actually pretty much everything here is based on the design of GSM and the global phone network. It's a vulnerability in design. It's not a vulnerability in AT&T, T-Mobile's network, whatever. They have to adhere to the specification. Mm -hmm. It's a requirement just to function to interact in a peer-to-peer -peer environment where they have to route calls from one provider to another. That is what they're designed to do. And, this, and uh, these holes that we've found are holes in the design. So it's not like we can go to uh, AT&T, and we actually did reach out to both AT&T and T-Mobile and say, hey, you know, we see these problems. Uh, what exactly is going on? Is there anything that you guys can do to mitigate this? And they are actually attempting to work on solutions. And I will say that they have both been very candid about working very diligently towards solutions to these problems. But again, these aren't things that they can uh, remediate easily, right? These are designs in the global in the global infrastructure, and they're problems that can't be easily circumvented without a lot of reengineering. So we've got one minute left. So obviously, scrub mitigations. Who has a voicemail pin? Who doesn't? Anybody really don't have a voicemail pin? <laughs> yeah, you're lying. I know every, a bunch of people do. Set a voicemail pin. And also, you can ask your provider about caller ID information. You can have them remove it or change it or do whatever, maybe, uh, if you're lucky and you get the, the person who actually likes their job at the end of the phone. Um, uh, some of the other provider thing, things that providers can do, you can stop, in, in the United States, you can stop putting the MC encoded into the ICC ID on the outside of the SIM card and stop using values like that um, as authentication values. Um, probably shouldn't be doing that. The MC is supposed to be private shouldn't be, the, the unique part of it should not be encoded into the ICC ID and then be used in other places. So if everybody remembers the AT&T iPad fiasco, that's why that was more important than it should have been. But that only applies to the United States. Um, the rest of the world doesn't do that practice. And it, that wasn't very widely known. Um, but it, you know, that, that is a public fact. And also, thankfully, AT&T allowed people to um, get replacement SIM cards. Um, so if you actually were affected by that, you can go ahead and do that. Um, also, for business users, again, um, ask about caller ID information, things like that. Um, uh, uh, offer opt-in and opt-out of caller ID for business users, I mean, if you're a provider. Also, enforce, and enforce voicemail pin setting, like uh, Verizon does this. You can't use your voicemail unless you set a nice pin. Um, tighter restrictions on SS7, which uh, Don was talking about earlier. And you know, logging, correlating events, suspicious activities, things like that. Probably a good idea. And it's very hard to mitigate against all of these attacks. It really is, because if you do that, you might break some stuff. You've got to remember that you're a customer service oriented industry, and you have to make sure that you're um, very compatible across the board. Um, and of course, there's some detection methods. Um, vigilance and common sense. Uh, who here has vigilance and common sense? Everyone. So Nathan's shaking his head. Well, <laughs> you're, still, you're still in college, so it'll eventually come to you. Um, oh. Eventually. Uh, maybe maybe uh, your lack of common sense was going to college. Have you thought about that? No, I'm kidding. Dude, you should uh, play the audio. Oh, OK. You know what? It's the last day. It's the last talk. We're out of time. But I got we something. We want to leave you with uh, something at least a little bit funny. But I don't think, is there, is there an audio hookup for this? Maybe not. Just play it with the mic. Oh, yeah, OK, OK. Hold on, hold on. So talking about voicemail pins and uh, caller ID spoofing, and dropping people into uh, actual caller ID scenarios where they're getting a call from somebody that they don't know, and they pick up the phone, and it sounds really weird. Yeah, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'll explain this after I play it. Hopefully you guys can hear it. If not, I'll just explain it. You will lose. Please enter your password, then press pound. Hello? Please enter your password, then press pound. Thank you for using T-Mobile voicemail. Goodbye. Yeah. So, so can somebody actually in the audience tell me exactly what just happened there? Anybody? So some guy Somebody got a just phone got call from his voicemail, picked up. His voicemail said, please enter your password. So he entered it. And of course, if you are the person on the other end of this, um, and, you're, and you've used all these tools to target this person, you're in the middle of an intelligence gathering operation against them, 
you decode the DTMF tones that they just entered, and you can tell that it was a four-digit uh, pin because they entered 